Welcome to episode 34 of the Chess TDD series. My apologies if the uh, audio here is a bit different than normal. I'm using my fiance's um, microphone for Rosetta Stone instead of the usual podcasting mic that I use. Um, so I, I don't know if that'll result in some kind of dip in quality or anything. Um, <clears throat> if so, my apologies. You know, turn up the volume and bear with me if you don't mind. So in this episode, um, I pulled the first thing off the Trello board and started to uh, refactor the original way that I had conceived of spec flow to use this new one that I got from Darren and like better. And um, this is just going to involve um, taking what I had done here with this scenario outline and getting the same testing functionality um, using this new style. And this new style is going to work a lot better because basically what I was doing there is saying, all right, you got to set up the board and then um, you should have uh, this move and this move and this move available to you, but not this move. Um, and what I've gone in here and done is going to be a lot more conducive to that because um, instead of doing all that, I'm just going to say, well, it should have exactly these moves. So then I don't need to add a new... Um, a new line uh, with and under the then clause for <clears throat> literally every thing it should or shouldn't have, which is kind of icky. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is not exactly um, a lot of fun to watch, I guess, but I'm not uh, getting into the business of doing too much um, screencast editing here unless it gets particularly gratuitous. So you get stuck listening to me talk and um, watching me do that sort of labor-intensive set of deletions. Um, the other thing that you might notice throughout this particular uh, episode is I was having a lot of trouble with my mouse, and there was a time that Visual Studio crashed, so this wound up being about 30 minutes. It could have been more like, I don't know, 23 or 24 of content, but I had a lot of oopses and such. <clears throat> However, I'm not uh, at any of those quite yet. So for now, um, I'm able to duplicate pretty well what I wanted to do um, with my original scenario. Here, I'm saying, okay, for this, this one pawn that you see on the board, it's the pawn's first move, so the pawn should be able to go forward one or forward two. And as you can see, if you look at these two things side by side, um, it's a lot more concise this way. I think this is uh, you know pretty great compared to what I was doing before. So the next thing up is that I want to do a test, and um, yeah, you can see. Oh no, it didn't happen here. I don't know. I'm, I'm sort of wincing in anticipation of all the mouse problems I had later. Um, so I don't remember exactly what I, I did some Trello housekeeping here and, and I forget kind of what I meant by this, but given how much the um, underlying world has changed in terms of approach, I'm going to, I'm just going to assume that that's kind of, you know, whatever I wanted to do with night there, since I'm now gravitating towards having a spec flow feature for each type of piece, I'm just going to say, well, okay, I'll turn that into just whatever it is I have to do for the implementation of knight, and then I'm adding one for queen, rook, bishop, um, and the pawn one is in progress. Um, and I guess tentatively I'll say that the king one is done, although we may uh, revisit pretty much any of the piece features later. So with a little bit of um, Trello housekeeping in the books on the left, I started to move over some of these but I'll worry about later things um, into the actual backlog now because having gotten this infrastructure set up for acceptance tests and seeing that it's starting to shake out bugs and really drive some of the uh, more polished implementation of what's going on with a real chessboard, uh, those are starting to become relevant. So on passant and uh, castling and such are no longer things that are way out there you know let's get the basics going first we've more or less got the basics going so those are going to be uh, relevant fairly quickly here um, as we do these spec flow scenarios so what i'm going to come in here and do next and you know i love how readable this all is as it goes i'm going to say like okay um let's do a scenario for a pawn that's already moved so this first one is a pawn um, right out of the gate where we should expect it to have those two moves available to it but 
if I come in here and say that, okay, let's take this chessboard, but then let's move that pawn up one. Well, now the pawn should no longer have two moves. Now it should only be able to move one piece, uh, one place ahead. So what I need to do before I can really express that is I have to, yeah, so you're seeing my mouse struggles, weird things were happening. Um, before I can express that, I have to say, okay, I'm, I'm given this chessboard. Um, Oh, right. It took me a minute to realize uh, why I could invoke this with given, but not, or with when, but not given. Uh, then I poked around and discovered, oh, yeah, it actually kind of says that in the attribute. Chalk that up to my not really knowing, knowing what I'm doing with spec flow. Oh, this is where Visual Studio crashed. So that little blip you saw there, I paused um, as the ID crashed, restarted, and got you back here. Um, so what i realized here is that yeah you've got oh hey you know the attributes are actually named given and when then there you go dummy um so uh, no big mystery here now why uh that was not working but while i was doing this what i noticed here is that i had all this dead code um this is a bit of a hand slap for myself uh, because of the crashing of the ide and everything that was going on i forgot that i had a red test briefly um I didn't go back and change it, but that's not a great thing to have forgotten. So there's all this green, everything looks good, but if you look in the bottom right corner, um, NCrunch is telling me that that spec flow test I had just recently written had gone red. Um, you know, it may be a mitigating circumstance that the IDE crashed and I kind of forgot what was going on, but it's not really an excuse. Um, refactoring of any kind when you're red is dangerous. Um, luckily, it worked out by changing that to when it went back to green but uh, if I could go back and do that properly I would have you know changed it to when first before I started deleting dead code um, so live and learn now what I need to do is figure out okay what am I going to do in terms of this gherkin um, uh, approach to say okay when I have a chessboard like this um, and then I do some movement uh, something else should happen. So I like the visual aspect of this. Um, I briefly entertained the idea of saying when there is a chessboard set up as, and then it's changed to, um, so I would display the chessboard before and after a move. That would be, you know, probably the best thing visually. It would look like the way they lay out chess pieces, but it, it occurred to me that that's a little over-engineering maybe from the start because I would have to create all this infrastructure to infer a move by comparing two chess boards. And I thought, eh, I'm not going to do that unless it really um, sort of makes a strong case for itself as I implement more stuff. So I'm going to think like, let's not just get too nuts with setting up a chess board and then doing a bunch of moves. But if I'm going to be um, setting up a chess board and then doing a single move, this is probably the way to go about it. Where what I'm going to do here is borrow from the... Um, then clause that I had implemented before, I'm copying and pasting that regular expression or whatever it is. Um, and this is basically just going to perform a move on the board. So it's going to slurp the board out of the scenario context. And then um, given whatever's passed in here as parameters to this method, it will execute that move. So I feel like this is a nice compromise. It's not as visually appealing. But as long as I don't start going in here and doing like 20 moves, um, I think you still get the visual and can relatively easily see what's going on. So I have these coordinates uh, that'll get passed in here. And as you can see, this is pretty straightforward. I'm just going to get the board out of context and then perform the move and that's it. So this is a little helper in the, um, the when area. And this is going to prove handy. Uh, especially for these scenarios where uh, it matters whether a piece is, you know, is this the piece's first move or not? Or like in the case of castling, I expect that this will come in handy because um, castling should be disallowed, for instance, if I've moved a king and moved it back. So <clears throat> I can see a use for this coming later. I'm not too worried about later, but um, I do keep things like that in the back of my head from time to time. So this will kind of shape up here relatively quickly. Um, it's not all that complicated and 
you can see this is now well, the test is green um, I'm not actually testing anything yet I'm just not blowing up the world in the um, in the when portion of the scenario so now I need to go to the then portion of the scenario and make sure that I have the piece that I expect or I should say the set of possible moves that I expect so the piece at one three and this is where I hesitated a little uh, on not doing the visual thing because it's a little confusing when you look at that diagram and you're going to say, what piece at 1-3? Um, but I figure it's not too much of a jump as long as you don't um, start going crazy with that. And maybe I'll look at improving it somehow later and maybe somebody will write in with some good ideas on how to do it. The only thing that occurred to me, like I said, was inferring a move from two different board visuals and... Um, that's kind of icky. I guess I could also have, um, uh, instead of inferring the move, I could have just had the one scenario and done something where I set the piece to having moved, but um, that seemed a little black magic-y too. Okay, so what's happening now is um, it is not... So the has moved, well, I won't spoil the fun here. Um, you can watch me go through and figure out what's going on. And I'll tell you what I'm doing here and why. So I have this failing scenario. And um, I suspect that what's happening is, you know, the maybe the pawn isn't behaving correctly, has moved, um, is not getting set to true. So I go into the pawn's um, unit tests. That's a great next place to go. So you're, you're doing something in the um, acceptance test, so you hit a problem. Time to go into the unit test because those are gonna be more fine grain. They're going to be further down on the testing pyramid and that's gonna provide me with some more insights. So what I learned from the um, pawn test is that, okay, this has moved is just a, uh, variable on pawn. So the problem isn't with the behavior of pawn. And in fact, that test in there where I'm setting has moved reminds me that I was in there thinking about this concept. So initially I thought, oh, well, I probably just have the next two spaces available to the pawn at all times. That's not true. I actually um, did apparently implement that sometime back to distinguish whether it's the first move or not. So what must be happening is um, when the board's move method is invoked, it's not properly setting um, has moved for the pawn. So the next thing that I do then is I'm going to say, okay, let me go into one of these um, scenarios here in the unit test that I've created for board and kind of figure out what's going on. And it looks like this one's as good a one as any. Um, there's this piece positioner. I'm setting up standard pieces. Um, so why don't I move, you know, some random piece here and then assert that um, that piece has moved after moving it. That seems like a pretty valid uh, thing that ought to be true anywhere. So I'm going to add it to this test class. Um, I'm going to actually perform the move. Then I'm going to get the piece that's at that uh, destination coordinate. And I'm going to say, hey, this piece's has moved method um, ought to be true at this point, or excuse me, has moved property. So far, so good. Um, now, I get a failing test here because, oh, uh, has moved isn't a thing. And then I remember that, oh, yeah, that was just a property on pawn, not on piece. So there's a pretty easy way to get this non-compiling red test to compile. So what I'm going to go in here and do is just use Code Rush's um, uh, refactoring to pull that property up into the parent class, um, and I and that shouldn't really create any problems with um, any existing tests at all. I don't think because uh, it's still going to be used the same way. It's still you know it's just going to be in the parent class, but it'll still be a property of pawn. But now these other classes in the general piece class um, have access to this. So that's good. I haven't, I still have these two failing tests because um, in both cases, board's uh, move method is not, um, this is both for the feature and this newer unit test that I've written, it's still failing because even though we've pulled that property up into the um, parent class, board still isn't doing anything with it. So it, I did a refactoring there. This gets a little nuanced and complicated. This was a refactoring that was not um, 
Well, I shouldn't call it a refactoring because uh, pulling that up to the parent class is really changing the behavior of the system. And even if it, even if you do consider it a refactoring, I was not doing a pure refactoring in the red green refactor. Um, I was trying to move towards getting the test green. So that isn't violating the general principles we're following here. Um, so in order to be able to have this move piece method um, set has moved to true, has moved needs to be on all of the pieces. So what I'm going to come in here and do is I'm going to say piece to move has moved is now true. Um, and that I think should get me to green and sure enough there it does. So this is pretty good. Um, now the acceptance tests are passing. So um, before the unit test had been doing the proper thing, but I'd never made the proper thing happen on board. And in fact, this is one of these things, as you'll see here in Trello, I think we need to figure out how has move gets set. You know, that's been in the backlog forever. And um, this is actually a subtle example of why I really kind of wanted to get to some real world scenarios and ex acceptance tests and all this kind of yak shaving with spec flow. Um, because what you start to do is you're, you know, we're testing the system the way it would actually be used. So now instead of me just kind of dreaming up all these things that ought to be done, like, uh, oh yeah, sometime we ought to, you know, do board and has moved. Well, if we're starting to lay out actual chess games and spec flow, that's going to become a real shortcoming. It's not just a thing that I know I ought to do. It's a thing that needs to be done or these acceptance tests won't pass. Um, so you start to see like what the shortcomings of the system are without having to keep that in your head. <clears throat> so here I, um, I decided, you know, I'll write one more um, test. And of course, it's never that simple. I thought, hey, I'm in about 15, 16 minutes of recording. So I'll write this one more piece of functionality and then call it and I'll finally get done on time here. So what I wanted to do was test that if you advance a white pawn to the end of the board, then it has an empty set of moves. And <clears throat> you might think like, why not just put the white pawn at the end of the board? Um, I want to be as true to reality as possible um, because has moved is going to need to get set on the pawn. You won't have a white pawn that's at that position in a real game without it having moved. Uh, I guess I could sort of do some stuff behind the scenes in this class to, um, in the scenario, allow a flag to be set to say that the pieces have moved or something. Um, that felt a little... Uh, gaming of the system I don't know so I didn't do it that way I figured I'll do the next best thing I'm still kind of gaming it it's awkward to start the white pawn at the seventh space but the outcome will be the same the piece will have moved and it will be in space number eight um, but now a weird thing's happening so um, I'm getting an exception and I'm not entirely sure why or how I, I can see that so if I move the piece to the end of the board and then I want to check to see what moves are available to it, somehow, some way that's bombing out. And the rest of um, this code cast here was sort of me trying to figure out why and also struggling mightily with my mouse. Okay, so index was out of, outside of the bounds of the array. There is a lot of stuff going on here, both in the spec flow, backing code, and in the board that orients around arrays. Um, and I can see that there are methods in here where there's no guard conditions and I'm not maybe throwing custom exceptions. Um, like if you look at get piece there, uh, if you pass in a, a coordinate that this thing can't handle, it doesn't really do any kind of checking. So it just um, is gonna barf up an index, uh, array index out of bounds exception. Uh, probably a thing I ought to do at some point is trap that exception or prevent it, and then throw a more specific domain-oriented exception. That's a thing that I tend to really like to do. I don't like letting general C-sharp exceptions kind of bubble out uh, to the people calling me. So the worst is the null reference exception happens in your code. So you call some uh, third-party API or whatever, and you get a null reference exception. And you don't know what the problem is. Is it that they screwed up and... Um, they're doing something wrong in the bowels of their code, or is it that you screwed up and you passed in something bad, and then you get annoyed because if you passed in something bad, why aren't they giving you a descriptive exception um, after kind of sanitizing the inputs to that method? Uh, so I try to generally be good about that. 
And if I had been good, you know, maybe I'd be getting a, hey, dummy, you passed in a whatever when you shouldn't have exception. And um, I wouldn't have spent as much time on this. So that's a lesson to take away just in general. Um, there's really something to be said for throwing domain specific exceptions. Um, and I try to do that whenever possible, save myself time down the line and save um, clients of my code, you know, that are calling into any public facing API that I have to save them um, sort of fits of rage. Back to the treasure hunt um, for this particular array out of bounds exception. So you can see that I was sort of um, quickly rifling through all these different classes, uh, setting the coverage to be for this um, test that's invoking me only. And I'm also kind of looking through, as I mentioned before, the um, finer grained unit tests around this situation. And I'm trying to think like, it's confusing to me because, hey, didn't I read a lot of unit tests about all these different board methods and I would have thought that I'd, um, you know, be checking for non-happy path cases in those unit tests. Um, I guess not. And, you know, that's a thing to go in and do later. But what I'm going to do here is, um, since it, it wasn't coming to me right off the bat what the problem was, I am going to create a new unit test class with a very specific context. And I'm going to create this test class that's just basically replicating um, the inputs to the board class as a board unit test instead of um, using spec flow to do it. And what that does is if I can, um, I've mentioned this before, so I'm not going to list it in the lessons to take away of this episode. Uh, but if I can recreate the problem here in a unit test for the board class, um, that lets me eliminate the possibility that I'm doing something wrong, either in spec flow or in you know the code behind it that's driving spec flow. And that's especially important to me because I'm not really all that familiar with these technologies. So it's important for me to to come to understand like, hey, am I am I just screwing up spec flow and um, doing something that's creating a red test that has nothing to do with my production code, or is this an actual problem in the production code? Uh, you see, I made a note there. I'm, it's really starting to strike me that I'm doing um, a lot of copying and pasting uh, when it comes to this test setup stuff. Um, I'm making myself into a hypocrite because I talked about um, how I generally force myself to type it out to feel the pain. And that is actually true. I'm just sort of, you know, there's an observer effect going on here. Uh, I was conscious of your time and the length of this episode and um, looking to be at about 23 minutes already. Uh, you know, I wanted to be done by now, so I didn't think I'd add insult to injury by making you watch me type a bunch of stuff. Um, but copy and paste is dangerous every time you do it. And it's, you know, I've often said it's like, uh, you know, breaking a bone and then taking a lot of morphine or something instead of uh, actually fixing the problem. So, yeah, it hurts um, because there's all this duplication. So I'll fix that by copying and pasting real quick. Well, it's not an actual solution to the problem. Um, so anyway, uh, I'll get off that soapbox, especially because I'm uh, making myself a hypocrite as I say it. But um, it is something to be aware of. And I, I would like to come back and take a critical look at, okay, why is, why is there so much copying of, you know, these uh, certain boilerplate items in the um, uh, test context setup here? And what can I maybe do uh, to unify that all in one place? And maybe there's nothing. I mean, it, you do wind up tolerating a bit more duplication when it comes to test code because you're going to optimize test code um, a little bit less for the single responsibility principle and a little bit more for readability and clarity and uh, making the context very clear and visual to anybody coming to this class. It might be that you can optimize for both and maybe I'm just not good enough yet at this to do it um, but for me I will absolutely optimize duplication out of existence in production code in test code it's a little more of a gray area for me um, but all that being said I don't think that any of this is particularly optimal there's probably a good thing we can uh, do here to make this a little bit better but now what I've done is using the um, 
uh, setup method before the test and setting up the context, um, I've recreated what I'm doing in spec flow and I say, okay, well, what get moves from should do is not bomb out. So I'm going to invoke and then say, let's get moves from 1.8 and it's green. Well, that's unexpected, right? I mean, wouldn't we have assumed that um, it should bomb out here just the way as it does, just the way it did in the acceptance tests? Perhaps you see the subtle problem. Um, I did after a minute, um, but you know, kudos to you if you see it right now. So I started to second guess myself a little and think, okay, um, what am I doing wrong in my spec flow setup? That's got to be the problem. So I'm going back here and kind of squinting at this and trying to conceive of what the issue is. Sure enough, index out of bounds, but it's not happening in the more fine-grained unit test. So I don't really like to get into the debugger too much. You'll see me avoid that as much as possible. First thing I'll do is um, limit the coverage to the failing test, uh, and then see if I can reason things out. I really like getting all my code reasoned out at compile time. I cringe if I need to observe what's going on at runtime to understand the code because that's usually a subtle smell um, that you're writing code that's too complicated or depends on global state or whatever. If, if you don't know at compile time what's going to happen and you just have to run it and see. Ooh. That's why um, I always thought like a lot of people really like that uh, edit and continue feature where you can like change the value of variables and stuff like as you're debugging and I always just that makes me shudder because that's like, you know, I don't know what this stuff is doing, but I'll just, you know, change the value of this variable and it seems to work. You know, it's like the epitome of programming by coincidence. Um, so I'm getting in here and I'm, I'm going to step through. I'm, I'm holding my nose and going into the debugger. Um, and right now I'm just looking to see if there's like anything wildly unexpected. So um, that's the aha moment. Like, wait, oh, I'm actually passing in a much different coordinate. But unfortunately, I'm not really seeing anything that's unexpected here. It is the coordinate that's getting passed in. So it's the same coordinate in the unit test and in the acceptance test. So that's a little discouraging. Um, and now I'm just kind of, I guess, poking around to see if I notice anything out of the ordinary. So it makes sense. Okay, all possible moves is listing this move that's off the board. Um, that's expected because I, I remember creating this that um, in the all possible moves, like get moves from the origin coordinate, uh, we're not going to worry necessarily about whether the moves are legal or not. We'll, we'll filter that out later. And I, I feel like, okay, it's obvious what's happening here. Get piece at this destination um, is passing in a coordinate that's not valid for the board and I'm not doing anything about it. So that's not a mystery. The mystery is why on earth is it working in the unit test, but not in the acceptance test? That's really what's uh, troubling me here. And, you know, you might get some people who just let that go. I, I did, that's what I mean about needing to run the code to know what's going on or something. I cannot deal with that. Um, I have to understand this before I can move on. Now, there's a subtle thing here, and I'm going to list this in the lessons for this episode. Um, link enumerable and deferred execution are very powerful in a lot of ways. Um, but the flip side of that is, and you can um, look back through my blog and see where I've written this about this before, um, you can get some pretty subtle bugs. So what's actually happening here, if you kind of look and, and you'll see me bear out what I'm about to say in a minute, that green test is only getting green because I'm not expanding the collection. So the get moves from is an I enumerable, it returns I enumerable. So what I'm doing is I'm building these Lambda expressions uh, for evaluation and I'm returning them. And in the acceptance test, I'm actually expanding the enumeration into a list or something. And in this unit test I just written so far, I haven't done that. So the unit test is green because it would throw an exception, but nothing's actually enumerated um, that sequence yet. So if I just say like, let's, um, let's get an actual collection of moves instead of this um, deferred execution uh, Lambda expressions, there we go. 
So now the behavior makes sense to me. I'm going to write this as a proper unit test and say that once we fix the problem here, um, what should really go on is that the count of moves uh, should be zero for this um, particular pawn at the end of the board. There should be no moves. And right now that's a failing test because it's just throwing an exception. So what should I do? Well, I have a bug in here um, that because of the deferred execution, I just never noticed. So all possible moves, um, I'm checking to see if any of the possible moves are blocked and I'm checking to see if a friendly piece exists. What I'm not checking to do is in all possible moves to see if the move in question is even legal. So what I wanna do is add this clause in here to say like, okay, well, the first thing I should, the very first thing I should check is, is this move even valid for the board size? If it's not, I don't wanna start looking at if it's blocked or does a friendly piece exist? And that makes everything go green. So life is good. Um, I'm gonna extract this now that everything is green. This is a three condition Boolean. Um, so I wanna give this a name that's a lot clearer and I wanna be more deliberate about this. So. Um, I'm going to extract this into a method that I then call, uh, I believe, is move legal or something. Um, so that's good enough for now. And I'm going to kind of wrap up here. I think I was having problems with the mouse again at this point. I don't remember. Um, and I hope I renamed that board cordon to move. That's not real clear, but I, I feel like I forgot to. Um, in my hurry to kind of get things checked in and, and move on. But... Um, so we've squashed that bug and that's good. There's probably a time where I'm gonna to have to come back in here and get a little bit better about the exception conditions because there are these public methods that are just not really checking the inputs at all and passing on through to an array. So you're gonna, as a caller, get these array out of bounds kind of things going on. Um, that's some polish we need to put on the application. Um, but for now, I'm gonna move on to continuing to drive out um, features uh, in spec flow for the episodes coming up. So thanks for stay, staying tuned and putting up with my uh, setup for the moment, and I will see you next time. Have a good one.